David Hume uh, is in many ways one of the most important and I would urge attractive figures in the Western philosophical tradition. A man of great wit, affability, charm. Uh, Hume was, by all who knew him, regarded as a admirable person, a pleasant person, uh, a man who had very few arguments in his life, it was very difficult to ever raise his temper. He only once became angry, apparently, and that was on uh, against Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who had stayed at his house and accused Hume of stealing his ideas. If any of you have read Rousseau and read Hume, you know that's a sign of Rousseau's paranoid insanity. Uh, Hume and Rousseau could not be more entirely apart in their views. Um, nonetheless, given this about Hume, he was, uh, in his own lifetime, a remarkably obscure philosophical figure. And this was largely the result of, uh, one, the very skeptical nature of his conclusions. He was thought to be very dreary and uninspiring. Um, and the rather technical precision of his arguments. He was a very difficult writer. He didn't inspire people. Um, I will argue that Hume has an inspirational side, but it's... Uh, very much in keeping with his character, it's very dry. It's very a dour sort of inspiration. In fact, uh, as a way of illustrating the way people misconceive Hume, when I first read Hume in college, I immediately assumed, because he's an incredibly powerful and accurate analytic thinker, that I had a mental picture of the, of the fellow as a very thin, wiry, school marmish professor, very, very accurate and precise. In fact, the very picture of Immanuel Kant. Um, I was much surprised to learn that, in fact, he was a large, robust, rotund Scotsman with a heavy, heavy brogue who could always be uh, counted on for a good joke, uh, a pint of, of uh, ale, and a leg of mutton. He was very much a laughing philosopher. Hume, in many ways, is the mo one of the most challenging figures in the philosophic tradition up to this point. The only one I could compare him to in this regard is Spinoza. You remember that Spinoza was challenging in that he was the first uh, complete rejecter of the Judeo-Christian ethic, completely rejected the notion of the immortality of the soul, of freedom of the will, and we will find Hume shares those beliefs, also is skeptical of Judeo-Christian tradition. In a way, he's far more damaging and challenging than Spinoza, whereas Spinoza is disgusted with that tradition. And finds it inane. Hume, as is his wont, is amused by it. He thinks it's absolutely hilarious that there are people who go to church. He thinks it's wonderful. Uh, he thinks it's the, the absolute, quote, bee's knees that people believe that somehow they're not animals. And he thinks this is just part of the good sport of life, that there are people out there who really believe such absurd things. And he does not want to dissuade them in any sense. He rather wants to laugh with his small group of esoteric uh, insiders as it were. Hume's hi historical significance is that he brought to full fruition the empiricist epistemology and phenomenology that really begins with Hobbes, matures with Locke, as we saw is developed by Berkeley. Hume in a certain way brings it to a close. He takes it to its logical extremes, to its point of logical conclusion, and sort of ties it up with a very nice bow. Although he never um, made much great fame in his lifetime, uh, afterwards he has become one of the most important philosophers in the tradition. He had a profound effect on a certain um, Prussian philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant, who claims, I read David Hume, he awoke me from my dogmatic slumbers. Uh, Kant claimed that Hume was, and I think one could say in, in defense of Kant, that Kant was the only one who understood Hume in the, in the 18th century, with the possible exception of Adam Smith. He was the only one who realized that this incredibly dry, dull, boring Scotsman is in fact a wild man, and is in fact on to the deepest critique of the philosophic tradition we have found yet. Since then, Hume has become a source of inspiration for utilitarian ethics in the 19th century, We'll see the logical positivist movement of the 19th century, figures like Carnap, Schick, uh, Ayer, Wittgenstein, all claim that their ancestry runs to David Hume. 
He's become an incredibly important thinker after his death. I would urge he was strongly ahead of his time. Okay, enough sort of background on Hume. Let's then begin with his empiricist uh, phenomenology. Hume, like Berkeley and Locke before him, recognized that all of our mental representations can be divided into two classes. On the one hand, our impressions, and on the other hand, our ideas. Now, Hume is aware that, Hume is, in fact, beyond aware, Hume's perhaps biggest project as a philosopher is the avoidance of dogmatism. And so he's aware that it would be dogmatic to say that our impressions are the result of sense datum. He wants to suggest that that's provisionally the case, and that's what we seem to believe in common sense. And Hume, by the way, is a great partisan of common sense. Um, presumably, then, let us say that our impressions are the result of sense datum, but actually the way we uh, distinguish between those and our ideas, copies of impressions, is by their vivacity. Again, by that phenomenological property. Your uh, visual representation of me, when you look at me, is far more powerful and, and profound and sharp than is, say, your recollection of what I looked like. There's far more detail in the first class. So that's the first class of our mental representations, impressions, distinguished by their greater vivacity. The second class are ideas or thoughts, and these are distinguished by their relative lack of force and internal clarity. Presumably, there are copies of impressions. Again, your notion of your uh, mental representation of me when you close your eyes is a copy of your actual sense datum of me, presumably. And in fact, there's another mark to suggest that one is the copy of the other, the process of temporal se uh, sequence. You never have an idea of what I look like or an image of me before you've actually seen me. If anything, your ideas follow your impressions, and that temporal sequence is a mark of copying or causality. Okay, now Hume argued, or claimed rather, I should say, on the basis of uh, an introspective and scientific observation, that there were only three principles with which the mind associated the various ideas, not impressions, but ideas that, uh, that it entertains. And again, I want to be clear about something about Hume. Hume is not arguing for any foundational view of the human mind. He claimed to be the Newton of the moral sciences. He was going to establish his philosophy on the basis of scientific observation. He says, from his introspective scientific observation of his own cognitive states, there are only three principles that associate the various ideas or images we have uh, in the show between our ears. Um, and the first of those is, of course, resemblance. Right? We say that the representation you have of me now strongly resembles the representation you had of me uh, when I was giving, uh, per perchance, my Barclay lecture. And certain strength of resemblance leads one to posit identity, right? But similarly, short of identity, we may say there is a stronger resemblance between my appearance and some other member of the audience's appearance than either of our appearance towards, say, this lectern. And therefore, we see how we form elementary set theory and elementary sorts of kinds. There's a stronger, again, resemblance between the idea of me and any of you than between myself and the lectern. So that's the first principle of association. The second <coughs> is uh, contiguity, right? All of our ideas can be related in terms of their spatial relationships or, or temporal relationships. So I am... Uh, from my perspective, to the right of the lectern presently and behind it. Uh, now, I'm to the left of the lectern and behind it, again, from my perspective. Similarly, the sentences I'm pronouncing now follow the sentences I pronounced, say, some one minute ago. So all of those representations fit into, as it were, uh, spatial configuration and temporal configuration. That's the other principle, contiguity. Now, we get to the third and far and away the most important and that is cause and effect, right? You see me release the watch, you see the effect of it falling, you attribute a causal agency. Okay. Now, we have all the principles of association. Let's now talk about um, our knowledge. And again, that can be broken down into one of two classes. 
The first class deals with the relations between ideas in a purely formal sense. For Hume, such knowledge is either intuitively certain or, if not, it is demonstrable. Okay. So, what would be examples? The common examples are the propositions of mathematics, geometry, algebra, formula logic. Are all cases where the association, with a, where the truth of the sentences hinges on the relation between the ideas, and that relationship is purely formal. In other words, a computer can figure out, can, can formulate true mathematical or uh, logical propositions. The key for Hume is that such propositions have absolutely no existential implications. We can accept all of Euclidean geometry as being true. Every proposition provable in Euclidean geometry, we can accept as true without there existing such a thing as a triangle. Similarly, we can accept all the propositions as logic as true without believing that there exists somewhere in the world a operator called the conditional or the disjunctive. So that's a, a key point, that that first class of knowledge, the relation between, between ideas, is purely formal and has no existential implications. It teaches us nothing about the world. It only teaches us, as it were, a very rig rigorous sort of vocabulary that we might be able to use in talking about the world. But about, it, it, in, it, in and of itself, has nothing to say about existence and things of the world. Things of the world are discussed in that second class of knowledge, which he calls um, matters of fact. Right? And that is those propositions which concern existential statements or statements of fact. The first thing to note is that there is no logical basis for all of our knowledge of fact. And how do we know that? Because counterfactuals are all possible. Which is to say, it is a fact that if I release this watch, it will fall. But it is entirely logically possible that if I release this watch, it would float up to heaven. It never has, right? I, I've never observed that myself. But there is nothing that logically constrains this watch to either fall down or, or not to simply re remain sustained in the air. Perhaps if I was the amazing Kresge or something, I could do such a trick. But uh, this point is, since counterfactuals are all logically possible, right, then there is no logical basis for knowledge of matters of fact. Well, then that raises, for Hume, the critical epistemological question. How do we know matters of fact? Specifically, how do we know any matters of fact other than that which you are presently sensing? Right? So you have good sensual uh, evidence to believe that I'm up here walking around. But how do you know, for example, that I really was here earlier talking about Barclay? How can you infer that? How do you know that if you leave this room, uh, this podium will still be here? Or this lectern, I should say. And Hume says that the answer is the principle of cause and effect. Right? You see my contiguity moving over from uh, in an earlier lecture to this one, and you assume that there's one agent who is causing all of these changes. Similarly with the lectern, you assume that unless something comes in to move it, its inertial force will make it remain here. So the only way you can uh, argue beyond your present sense datum to the fact that there is a world outside, that there are lights above you producing heat and light, is because of the principle of cause and effect. That's the fundamental glue, as it were, epistemological glue of the factual world. Because it allows us to infer from sense to unsensed phenomena. Now, cause and effect is not known uh, what we might call a priori, or before the fact, or before experience. Um, rather, it only comes from the experience of constant conjunction. So, again, back to our great experiment. You did not know before you ever saw someone release an object that it would fall. The only way you know that is that every time you've seen an object released, it falls. That constant conjunction, release, fall, release, fall, is the only evidence you have of that causal relation. And similarly it is with all the other causal relations. The only way you know that eating a cheeseburger will satisfy you when you're hungry, if in fact it does, is because that's happened in the past. 
it is entirely conceivable that you could eat a cheeseburger and be three times as hungry afterwards as before. It doesn't happen that way because of the nature of our constant conjunctions and experience, but all of our causal laws are just that. We see regularity, constant conjunction, and from that we infer a causal relation. Well, the implications for science, therefore, are very important. If science gives us causal explanations, all it does, in a way, to use the, the metaphor from the right stuff, is it pushes back at the envelope of ignorance. Right? So when we learn uh, the causal law, what causes this watch to, to, to fall? Well, I release it. Well, uh, what causes it to accelerate at the rate, rate it does? The laws of gravity. What causes the laws of gravity? It beats me. We don't know yet. Perhaps we will someday. Perhaps Grand Unified Theory will supply the explanation. But all you do is you push back that envelope of ignorance one step further. And that's an important empiricist and Humean point, is that science never offers absolute truth. It's provisional truth, constantly subject to revision on the basis of new experience and new formulation. Okay. Back to our big epistemological fish we want to fry. Given that all our not knowledge of matters of fact is based on cause and effect, and that cause and effect is in turn based on experience, the experience of constant conjunctions, what warrants our belief in experience? Right? Well, it can't be reason, can it? Or logic. That can't warrant our belief in experience. For it's logically possible that uh, the future won't resemble the past. Right? It's entirely possible that from, in 15 minutes from now, God will so change the universe that whenever you release a watch, it'll float up to heaven. Or it will remain suspended. You have no logical evidence to suggest that that won't happen. All you have is your past experience. Right? And your present experience. So, clearly experience, which is the, the judgment that the future, in fact, will resemble the present, can't be based on reason. And, by the way, I should point out, you could also make that argument retrospectively, as Bertrand Russell does. How do we know the past doesn't, uh, is not different from the present? How do we, in fact, know that once upon a time, you know, the sun really didn't move around the earth, and that the, uh, the Bible didn't have it right, and things have changed since then? And that's, that's the puzzle that Hume feels is the critical epistemological puzzle that has to be solved. Right? And, and clearly, we do not have any recourse to logic or reason in answering this question. Well, you can't base uh, experience on cause and effect for the obvious reason that cause and effect is based on experience. Right? Our belief in causal uh, laws is based on our experience of constant conjunction. So you can't use those causal laws then circularly to uh, support the belief that the future will resemble the present or the past. Because, of course, causal laws presuppose that resemblance. And Hume luxuriates in this riddle, uh, riddle for a while because he has uh, a very obvious answer. And an answer which is going to offend all of the highbrow intellectuals of Europe. Why do we believe in cause and effect? It's a habit. It's a custom. No rational basis for it whatsoever. It's not reason that teaches us cause and effect. It's instinct. You can't dispense with believing in causal laws as you go about the world. When you get hungry, are you going to say, well, I'm not going to eat for three days. That'll fill me up. It's habitual to believe that, as cheeseburgers did me good before, they'll do me well again. Uh, so the point is there's something extra rational which uh, orients our behavior and understanding of the physical world. It is uh, irrational to believe in experience that the future will resemble the present, but it's customary and it's in fact inescapable in practical life. Common sense knows better than philosophic uh, insight. So experience then is warranted by a sort of natural instinct instead of a rational proof. How can we in fact argue that persuasively? Well, the first thing he points out is, notice simpletons, children, animals, all follow causal laws, don't they? Right? You've all heard the experiment of Pavlov's dog. But can children, simpletons, and animals do logical proofs? They are all able to observe uh, causal laws and clearly can't rationally demonstrate anything. All right, so the implication is it must be some sort of instinctual response. Okay, if all of our knowledge of matters of fact is based on cause and effect, right? And all matters of cause and effect is based on 
experience. What is the origin of the roughly interchangeable metaphysical doctrines of power, force, and necessary connection? Well, Hume points out, first of all, there's no logical doctrine of necessary connections in the world because, as we've seen before, logical proofs have no existential implications. Right, so if we want to argue that there is force in the world, we can't do so on a logical basis. And also, force, necessary connection, can't arise from sense. I mean, what color is a necessary connection? What flavor is it? When do you actually experience a necessary connection? And he's careful to, to point out some of the errors that, in fact, later thinkers will think are profound proofs of it. Uh, Tolstoy made a lot out of, he said, you want, to show, want me to show you force? Look. Right? I will to lift my arm, and it's up. Force. And Hume says, no, no, no. That's, in fact, the experience of constant conjunction. Every time you desire to lift your arm, it's gone up. You want to do the proof? Want me to prove it to you? I'll str uh, we'll see if we can't give you palsy somehow. And you'll sit there for the next three hours and try and lift your arm, and it won't go up. Where'd the force go? Where'd the necessary connection go? Must have disappeared. Maybe God intervened. So he points out that, in fact, all of your sense of physical force in controlling your bodily actions are entirely on the basis of the constant conjunctions you've had between your will and, uh, and the movement of your body. And there are times when you'll be in deliriums or sick when you won't be able to move them. And you'll try. And you'll fail. Okay. So then, Hugh answers this question finally. Necessary connection, force, energy, all those metaphysical doctrines, they're just powerful psychological conditions. You've seen constant conjunctions which are so constant and so sure that your mind just leaps the next step and says, well, it's necessary. Can't be avoided. But it's just a psychological phenomenon. In fact, since all ideas have their origin in sense, if there's no sensual basis for an idea, we can say as a fact that there is no, uh, that the, the notion itself is a chimera, right? Is a myth. It's a fantasy. And here's where we turn, of course, to Barclay's uh, Hume's discussion of Barclay. All right, Barclay had said, well, when do we experience matter? We have no sensual experience of matter. And Hume, in his wonderful sense of wit, says, well, of course you're right. It's a brilliant criticism by Barclay. We never do experience matter. Now, what color was a mind again? And what flavor is your mind? What does it taste like? You never experienced a mind either. Well, in that case, if you want to get rid of matter, fine, but we'll throw mind out with it too. And then all that there will be in our universe is one damn thing after another. Right? We'll just have one representation after another, no mind to hold them, no matter to, to project them. And Hume, of course, is, is happy with that answer because his point is that our belief in matter and our belief in mind isn't a result of metaphysical speculation. It's life. Right? It's a common sense intuition. And common sense is more than functional for getting us through the world. Okay, then Hume moves on to the discussion of freedom or liberty and necessity. And again, Hume the peacemaker argues quite controversially, you know, no one's ever really disagreed about this. People think they disagreed, but they didn't. The more you think about it, all reasonable people know that um, necessity and causation, which are the essence of determinism, are simply the experience of constant conjunctions and the belief that the future will resemble the past. And that's natural to all animals, or all, all higher animals. Right? And that, if you've got that, you're happy with determinism. The other side, liberty, is simply the absence of external restraint. No one's tying you down. You are free to stand up and leave at any moment. It's Liberty, then, has nothing to do with some abstruse doctrine of a free and uncaused will, and it's perfectly consistent with a causally determined universe. So we have liberty, hopefully, if we have libertarian governments, and we have determinism in that certainly all of our actions are follow causal laws. In fact, he says, if our actions had no causal laws, right, if our actions were not a result or caused by our character, then we would have no basis for moral evaluation, for punishment or blame. And consider, if I was at this moment to pull out a gun and shoot someone in this audience, Hume says, you must believe that that was caused by the nature of my character. If you don't, if you think that was a truly free act, that is to say uncaused, then it is spontaneous. There is no reason for you to believe that I would ever do that again, since nothing caused me to do it. 
I did it once, maybe I won't do it again. So then why in heaven's name would you bother to punish me? Right? It certainly won't deter me from doing it again. I'm not caused to do it. You just point out to me, we wish you wouldn't do that. And then we cart the body off and I go on with my lecture. He says, of course, it's not that way. If I pulled out a gun, you would infer from that that I'm some, some, some sort of psychopathic maniac. And that it's on the basis of that causal connection between psychopathic maniacism and shooting members of an audience that you were going to grab a pair of handcuffs and drag me out of here. And if you didn't believe there was that causal relation, then punishment would only be an act of bizarre vengeance. So we obviously believe in that sort of causal uh, law in action. And in fact, it's demonstrated in, in our interactions with our friends. Right? He says, we know what our friends are going to do. If I put my hand out, he's going to grab it and shake it. If I ask him how he is, he's not going to spit in my eye. I know the fellow nice enough. He's going to give me a, a stock answer. Fine, how are you? Um, there's no surprises there. And Hume, of course, has a, 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 a wonderful little joke. He says, everyone believes in causal determinacy and behavior in practice. It's only in theory they don't. Go by, well, he talks about Charing Cross, but let's say Times Square in New York City. He said, anyone, have you ever noticed that people don't go by Times Square, take out their wallet and stick it in the middle of the ground and walk away and say, I'll come back for that in an hour? For some reason or other, they seem to think that people will be costly determined to pick it up and take the funny green paper out, right? And Hume says, the fact that no one does that proves that everyone believes in causal determinacy. And that if, if you put your wallet in the middle of Times Square and came back for it an hour later, you wouldn't find it. And we all feel fairly certain of that. Okay. Now, Hume now turns to, uh, in his discussion of the inquiry concerning human understanding, his chance to, for what I would call, sort of payback. Hume was a remarkable prodigy in his youth, wrote a fantastic book at, I think, the age of 24, called The Treatise Concerning uh, Human Nature, um, and applied for a position teaching pneumatic philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, and was blackballed by the Scottish Calvinist clergy because of his agnosticism. Um, I think that profoundly affected Hume's beliefs ever since and his motivations in philosophy but he certainly realized that the best way of getting back was not to denounce or scream or be angry but to laugh to joke and that raises his discussion of miracles he says let's first define what do we mean by a miracle a miracle is simply by definition a violation of the rules of nature of the laws of nature which are which are established through the sum of human experience through the sum of our observed constant conjunctions. So miracles are that which uh, there's no rational basis to believe in. That's the definition of a miracle, something which is incredibly irrational to believe in. So we'll notice something. Have you ever noticed how there are very few miracles that occur in Times Square? Very few miracles occur in the White House or in NASA labs. Most miracles seem to occur among very primitive peoples and in very barbaric situations. I mean, our lady, we have Our Lady of Guadalupe, but we don't seem to have Our Lady of Cambridge. Right? So he says, well, it's one thing to make you sort of suspicious about miracles to begin with. Um, then he goes on to, however, say something which is, raises the uh, relationship between something called exoterica and esoterica. And it's one of the forms of free-thinking, enlightened humor. Um, there is, however, a deep philosophic point to that. There's a deep philosophic point to laughter itself. What is the only thing you can't laugh at? The sacred. Everything else can be laughed at. In effect then, by laughing at everything, humans desacralizing everything. Everything is worthy of laughter. Everything is a jest. And uh, that, he thinks, is a means of human liberation. Okay, we've gone through skepticism. I should point out one of his interesting arguments about religion that comes up. He has a mock dialogue in, in the text with an Epicurean who says, well, actually, morality has nothing to do with religion. We could all be atheists and we would still be just as moral as we were before. There's no logical basis from which you can go to a belief in a god to moral behavior. And Hume says, I think quite wisely, sir, I would acknowledge you to be a just reasoner, but not a good citizen. You say that because there is no logical reason uh, or argument from the belief in God to moral behavior, 
that in fact no one actually makes that leap from belief in God to moral behavior. But of course most people aren't very good reasoners. There are a lot of people who do believe in God and it restrains them from the most hideous acts. And therefore I would account you a very bad citizen for speaking that argument publicly. And that I think is, is Hume's considered view. He does not believe in God. He doesn't believe in religion. He thinks it's af absolutely laughable. But he would be extremely upset if anyone were attempt to argue against it publicly. Right? If there are people who would go out there and commit hideous crimes if they didn't believe in God, best to keep those sheep in line and stop them from becoming wolves. And it's very much, again, that exoterica, esoterica notion. There's a small circle of people who are mature enough and responsible enough to realize that even if God does not exist, they still have moral duties and responsibilities. Uh, for those who do not realize that, it's simple. The best thing is to keep your mouth shut and not tell them anything. All right. We're left, however, with a certain amount of skepticism from Hume. And Hume is quite direct about skepticism. He says, if we take the Cartesian problematic seriously and doubt our faculties, there is no way to think your way out of a paper bag. If you doubt your faculties, there's no solution to skepticism. And in fact, skepticism is not ever logically refutable. It is entirely logical, logically possible that each and every one of you are the only thing in existence in the universe. And everything else is just a dream or delusion. Well, how then do you refute skepticism? And this is Hume's brilliant answer. You certainly don't do it philosophically. How do you do it? You get hungry. You may think you're the only thing in the universe, but when you get hungry, you'll go out for a cheeseburger and, and a Coke. Practical life is the solution to skepticism. It has no practical consequences. Why would anyone ever believe in such a doctrine? Right? So skepticism is refuted by common life, and that's the Humean Scottish school of common sense. You want to know how to answer these questions? Not through abstract reason, through life. What's the point of believing you're the only one in the world? It's awfully lonely. Wouldn't it be better off to, wouldn't we all be better off to believe we're each, we're each other there? Isn't it practically more fulfilling? And hence the importance of practical life. Okay, well if that extreme skepticism then is simply a joke, and uh, Hume does in fact think it is. He has a, a wonderful little passage where he says that our skeptic who doubts his own existence is like a, a dreamer. When he awakes from his dream, he will be the first to join in the laugh against himself and to confess that all his objections are mere amusement and can have no other tendency than to show the whimsical, whimsical condition of mankind who must act and reason and believe, though they are not able by their most diligent inquiry to satisfy themselves concerning the foundation of these operations or to remove the objections which may be raised against them. What's important about that passage is he's saying skepticism right, is irrefutable except for practical life, at which point you realize that all skepticism is just a joke. It's just a sort of a, a very dry sense of humor. What have we read so far in this book? It is filled with skepticism. What kind of a book is this? This is a joke book, Hume is saying. There's nothing serious in this book. Read this and laugh. That's what you should get out of philosophy. It's a lot of fun. It's like playing chess. Nothing hangs on it. What hangs on life? Good mutton, good ale, good fellowship, good humor. That's what's important in life. This, eh, if I've amused you for, for 30 minutes, wonderful. You've gotten more than enough out of philosophy. That's all you could get out of it. But then he does get serious. He says, there, however, there is a lesson to be drawn. Not from an extreme skepticism, but from a moderate skepticism. And this comes back to his own personal history. And this is where I think is Hume's ultimately most liberating project and one of the reasons why he still is, speaks to us today. He tells us that the great majority of mankind have a tendency to be rather certain of their opinions. They tend to believe that what they believe is absolutely certain and true what other people believe is insane and evil. <coughs> and yet we can't even know, can't even show any logical basis for our belief in cause and effect. So then what do we call that nature of belief? Dogmatism. And that is the human project. What do you do with skepticism? When you find some dogmatic thinker who tells you, well, the world is really mind and matter, or someone else says, no, it isn't, it's just matter. 
you sit them down and you give them a wee small tincture of fearlessness, a wee small tincture of skepticism. And from that, hopefully they'll learn a little bit about, quote, hubris, before they blackball someone from a university because he doesn't believe in the right version of Calvinism, he point out to him how impossible it is to demonstrate Calvinism in the first place. And maybe they'll be a little more open-minded. I think this is a topic which is very germane, not only for our culture and society, but for our high culture today as well, and, and, and academy. Right? I think it's important for us to realize that Hume is right. The point of skepticism is to teach us to be a little bit less dogmatic, to realize that even if I think A and you think B, that doesn't mean that you're stupid or I'm evil. We may just equal, have equally tenable views, or I may think mine is slightly more tenable, but it doesn't make you wrong or stupid because you disagree. There's plenty of room for disagreement short of logical demonstration. And Hume's point is that the vast bulk of what's important to us is short of logical demonstration. Therefore, the ultimate virtue that we must have is toleration is to learn to be open-minded, especially with people we disagree with. To overcome our tendency towards dogmatism. And I don't think it's coincidental that Hume speaks of those he thinks are worst in the dogmatism. And he says, um, if any of the learned speaking of university professors, if any of the learned be inclined from their natural temper to haughtiness and obstinacy, a small tincture of Peronism, skepticism, might abate their pride by showing them that the few advantages which they may have attained over their fellows are but inconsiderable if compared with the universal perplexity and confusion which is inherent in human nature. In general, there is a degree of doubt and caution and modesty which in all kinds of scrutiny and decision ought forever to accompany a just reasoner. And I can't help feeling that that is in fact the ultimately most fruitful project of the Enlightenment, and Hume represents it, the critique of dogmatism, which he associated with rationalism. He associated with the continental tradition, is the critique of uh, the tendency to pound the desk, and certainly we've seen that, and we'll see it in subsequent thinkers. Philosophers who tell everyone before me was an idiot. All the people who disagree with me are swine. And Hume's deep point is that nowhere is that more prevalent than among people with PhDs. They are probably the most dogmatic people on the planet. And Hume, I think, is actually angry. His view is, of all the people in the world, they are the least excusable for that. For if they could think their way out of a paper bag, they would realize they can't be sure about almost any of their beliefs, except for mathematics and logic. Aside from that, everything is provisional. Then how dare they, and I think what he's really concerned about is not just blackballing, you know, young professors, as we found happened during the McCarthy period, but also something worse, perhaps the pedagogical equivalent of eating one's young, telling your students that well, this is the truth I'm teaching you now. I know you'll read other books, but they're wrong. My opinions, those are the important ones, and I can prove it all. And that's what Hume disdains. The life of the mind, the life of education, should be cheerful, should be happy, should be open-minded, should be playful. There's nothing very serious going on here. There's nothing crucial worth killing one another over or denouncing one another over. We should enjoy ourselves. It should be light, it should be open-minded, it should be just and moderate. I think from this you will get a sense that for all of his agnosticism, Hume is in his own way uh, perhaps the most vocal expression of Jobian secularism, right? I mean, he in a way does have that Augustinian strain of humility and of piety, and yet he's completely secular. And I think that's what's intriguing about that tradition, which very much suffuses in the Anglo-American world is once it becomes secularized, that sort of metaphysical posture has a certain charm and endearing value to it. It is the first time, it is only from that perspective, that tolerance, freedom of belief, freedom of opinion, can actually be seen as a virtue. Right? Well, I should point out that Hume dies in 1776, the year of the American Revolution. America does enact freedom of belief, freedom of speech, but not as a positive good. 
mean, most Americans had done it because they had no choice. There were too many sects in North America to maintain uh, a, an orthodoxy. And so it was a marriage of convenience. They were forced to allow freedom of, of belief. Uh, in fact, it didn't always obtain everywhere. Massachusetts retained an established church until the 1830s, as did Connecticut, as did several colonies. It was only with Hume that he begins to say that's not a necessary evil at all. That's the essence of the good life. There's nothing so serious in those churches that can't be laughed at occasionally. And there's nothing so serious about my own work that can't be laughed at, and in fact should be laughed at. If you want to know really moral insight about the world, it's not philosophy texts. Maybe it's history. Hume became an historian. That's one of the other reasons I know he's such a wise man. He realized what was really important. Um, finally, I want to offer one more reason I think that this Humean liberation, critique of dogmatism and rationalism, is so valuable for us. And it's because it's something philosophers call reflexive. It can be used upon itself. Hume ends his work with a bit of spleen uh, at the rationalist and scholastic tradition that he felt was oppressive. He says, once we know that the only sort of knowledge you can have, right, that's certain, demonstrably certain, is logic and mathematics, or uh, matters of fact evidence based on experience, when we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any exper experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. How would we reflectively uh, apply Hume to Hume? We would point out, Dave, there's more to religion than that. Religion gives people spiritual solace. If people need what William James called moral holidays or cosmological holidays, why deny them? As long as they're not dogmatic, why should you be dogmatic? And I think that is ultimately when that Humean ethos uh, hits the United States in the late 19th century and gets its ultimate clarification in William James, that is exactly where it ends. Uh, Hume has turned against himself to say, look, you too must be tolerant of people who believe in religion and in Christianity. It has its value for those people, and you must be open-minded.